This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. There is a new lake in Kentucky, and it's right on top of the old lake. We go inside outdoors this week to take a look at what's in store for Lake Cumberland now that Wolf Creek Dam is repaired and 40 feet of lake has been restored. Kentucky's largest lake now holds promise for anglers not seen since its creation. If you love to fish, it's time to come back. Come back to Cumberland, ahead on Kentucky Afield Radio. A canoe can take you places barely found on a map, but there's a but coming. Canoes account for nearly twice the boating deaths as personal watercraft. A fact, nearly two to one. Not that you shouldn't canoe, but this might, might, give you twice the reason to wear a life jacket, as if one isn't enough. So, if you take your solitude seriously, take this advice. Your life jacket's got your back. A reminder from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. In the news, whales have been spotted in Kentucky waters. We have an expert standing by on the water's edge. There goes the bobber. (laughs) Set the hook. (gasps) Daddy, it's a whale. Way to go, buddy. Childlike wonder for the outdoors. It still exists. Where to go, what to take, and how to get started are waiting at the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website, fw.ky.gov. Take a kid fishing. Don't let the opportunity get away. Charlie Baglin in on Kentucky Field Radio, and 2007 doesn't seem like that long ago unless you make your living at Lake Cumberland, where you saw boat docks close, the economy goes south. They dropped the water level 40-plus feet to repair Wolf Creek Dam. Now the dam is done. Water level is back, and it is time to come back to Lake Cumberland. John Williams is the district fisheries biologist for the southeastern region of Kentucky. That means he's in charge of all things to do with fish in the area. He is my guest today, and we will talk about the future and the silver lining to all of this. John, take us back. What caused the drawdown to begin with? Right. We can probably go a little bit before 2007. I know a couple of years before that, the Corps of Engineers were concerned about water leaking through the the dam structure and they kind of modified the release instead of letting the water come up in the spring and stay up if we had a lot of rainfall they would try to get rid of that water to get pressure off the dam by 2007 then they decided you know they were going to have to uh, repair the dam and that's when the decision was made to lower the water level to uh, to start on the, the dam repair for perspective 723 feet is the normal lake level, correct? That's correct. And it was drawn down to 680? That's correct, 43 feet below Summer Pool. How did you arrive at 43 feet? The Corps, uh, I guess they decided 680 was a, was kind of a compromise elevation. I'm sure, ideally, they would have rather brought the lake down even more. But that's about as low as they could bring it and still have the lake functional. And they did have to extend a lot of the ramps on the lake to make them accessible to boaters. My guess is that was kind of a compromise lake elevation, getting it down as low as they could to keep pressure off the dam so it wouldn't worsen while they fixed it, but still have enough water in the lake where it wouldn't severely impact recreation. So 680 feet. We're talking a couple of different things here. A way of life in the Lake Cumberland area, such as boating, fishing, people who run restaurants and marinas and the the influx of people to support these businesses. We're also talking science in that words like dissolved oxygen will come up. The fish need a certain level of habitat simply to exist. Yeah, dissolved oxygen is a a critical parameter for fish survival. Typically during the year, oxygen levels run on the surface run from, say, 6 milligrams per liter or part per million up to, you know, 10 milligrams per liter parts per million and obviously fish need dissolved oxygen to survive during certain times of year especially late summer early fall in the deeper water that doesn't have access to the surface and and doesn't get much sunlight penetration where oxygen can be produced through uh, photosynthesis of the of the plankton in the water 
then uh, that can become depleted. And so what typically happens in late summer, early fall, the deep water, which is cooler and typically where striped bass and walleye and the cool water fishes stay, that zone of water gets depleted in oxygen, so the fish become stressed. We've seen it in the past few years can get as low as, well, some of the water column gets completely devoid of oxygen, and then the other parts are maybe one or two milligrams per liter, which is very stressful to the fish and, and can cause fish kills and has caused fish kills in Lake Cumberland. So you couldn't have that. The Corps of Engineers couldn't have said, we want to get this done in a hurry, and we're worried about communities downstream. We're just going to just drain the lake. We're going to drain it right all the way back to Cumberland River. Couldn't have done that and been good neighbors, could they have? No. <laughs> no. I'm sure to facilitate their repair, that would have been great for them, but they, safety is a major factor. They didn't want to do anything that would uh, you know, jeopardize people downstream. But then recreation was a another factor they took into consideration. And as I said earlier, I think that's one of the reasons they, they didn't bring it down even lower than the 680 elevation is so that they could maintain you know, one of the uses for the, the lake, which is recreation. I am reminded almost every spring when it rains, or correct me, monsoon season, there generally is a, a flood season in this state somewhere. And if you remember in the news, I can't remember the year, but it's been within the last handful, that there was quite the deluge of rain in the Nashville, Tennessee area. And it, it seemed like the 20 yard line at Titan Stadium was 20 feet underwater. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. And, and uh, I'm kind of like you. I don't remember exactly which year it was, but yes, I remember that. In downtown Nashville, I mean, that was a, a place you would need a boat to get around the streets. If I remember, I, I'm thinking maybe that I should edit, edit that out. But it, there was a lot of rain, a lot of water in Nashville. Now, if that image is still in your mind, that is what could have happened had that dam breached there at Wolf Creek. Am I right or wrong? That, that's correct. Uh, yeah, the Nashville would be flooded if, if the dam, uh, you know, breached and and, uh, and probably, you know, even cities on downstream. But, you know, obviously that would be a, a catastrophic uh, event. And uh, But I believe, and I read some of the reports the Corps did, is... They had some, I uh, forget the term they used, maybe tunneling or whatever. When they get, you know, water is great for finding the weak spot mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in an area. And once it finds its way through, then you can start getting, you know, they, they were getting, uh, I guess, wet spots in the dam and, and a slurry. So, uh, you know, gone, if, if they'd have let that go a few more years or maybe even just, you know, months, then it could have uh, quickly gotten much worse and... Uh, you know, may have gotten to the point where they couldn't repair it. Uh, we we mentioned Nashville just simply because people know where that is, but there are communities all the way between Lake Cumberland and downstream, and and, and even beyond Nashville, I mean, Lake Barkley uh, could have. I mean, it, it would have been quite the flood, right? Because you know, Lake Cumberland's fifty thousand acres, and it's you know. Uh, over 100 feet deep, and so when you're talking volume of water, that's a lot of volume of water to potentially put uh, downstream. So fortunately, those days are behind us, that fear that that dam will breach, now behind us. Lake Cumberland's now back on the rise. Talk about Lake Cumberland. What makes Cumberland unique? All else aside, Lake Cumberland on any given day, 1985, what makes it unique? compared to the other lakes in the state? Well, I think several things. You know, it's obviously it's one of the larger lakes uh, in the state, uh, you know, both surface acreage and volume. You, really, in the lake, you have quite a bit different types of habitat, you, you know, going from the, the shallow flats up in the heads of the creeks to the sheer bluff walls on the main stem and, and part of the, you know, toward the mouths of the creek arms. And you have a variety of fish habitat from shallow stumps and willow trees and uh, to cool water habitat for stripers and walleye and smallmouth bass. And so generally whether you're a largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, striper or walleye, you can find a place in the lake uh, that's to your liking. 
And so I think one of the things about Cumberland, it, it does provide a variety of fisheries. Um, and, of course, the recreational opportunities, it's, it's big enough where you can put large boats on it and run them up and down the lake. And, um, and of course, the houseboats, you know, houseboat capital of the world around Somerset, Monticello area. And uh, so it's a, it's a great destination spot for people uh, wanting to come down, especially during the summertime. The topic is the rebirth of Lake Cumberland and the man in charge of all things to do with fishing in Kentucky's southeastern region, John Williams, is my guest. My name is Charlie Baglin. We will be back with more after the break. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. We are back on Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. And John Williams, a voice that you hear often on our fishing report, is with us today for the full hour to talk about Lake Cumberland. He is in charge of all things fishing in the southeastern region. He is the district fisheries biologist for the Kentucky Division of Fisheries and is in charge of such lakes as Laurel River Lake and Lake Cumberland. Lake levels have been restored, John, at Cumberland, and we are talking about species. Yeah, since Cumberland does have depth, one thing you run into in some lakes that are real deep is once you get into below the thermocline, especially in a lake that's extremely fertile, then during the summer and fall you, you virtually have no oxygen below the thermocline. And whereas Lake Cumberland, since it's kind of a moderate fertility lake, does maintain some oxygen below the thermocline, and that's what provides a habitat for the walleye and the striped bass. So uh, essentially different fish species have different temperature preferences of, of water that they would prefer to be in. And if that water that's to their temperature preference has enough oxygen, then that's essentially where they're going to be. Cumberland provides habitat for the warm water fishes that like it shallow and warm, and then also for the cool water fishes that like it a little deeper uh, in cooler water. Compare, if you will, Cumberland to some of the other lakes that you just happen to know the depths of. The deepest lake I'm familiar with uh, in our district would be, would be Laurel Lake, and it has sections over 200 feet deep near the dam. Now, Cumberland at, at normal pool is like 160, 170 feet deep. So it's a, Cumberland overall is a, you know, a very deep lake, and I think Laurel would be slightly deeper. Cumberland would be next. Uh, Del Hollow is not as deep as Cumberland, I don't believe. And so I would say in our, especially in southeast Kentucky, Cumberland would be the, the second deepest lake. And, and of course, volume-wise, it's our largest. You said you had a 50,000-acre lake. And when you drew that level down to 680, how many acres did we lose? What did that go down to? 30... It went down to about 37,000 uh, surface acreage. So we lost, what, 13? 13,000 acres of water. A lot of people complained initially when the lake was drawn down, and, you know, in some ways, that's kind of set the stage for what we're going to have a, a rebound here this year and the following years, especially by keeping the water level close to 680 year-round, which is different than what it had been before. You know, we, we used to experience wide fluctuations of water level throughout the year. Just based on my calculator. The lake was drawn down to 74% of what it was originally. So now you've got like a, a quarter of the lake in addition to that. We're right. going to talk about new lake effect coming up. But you have that additional 25% of a lake now that you didn't have. It seems to me it's easier to catch fish out of a smaller pond or the same number of fish out of a larger pond. That's kind of the argument we made when the lake was first drawn down is this is, you know, for the fishermen, this has really got to be a bonus because any time you take that number of fish and, you know, draw the lake down to where it's a smaller volume of water, that's got to put the fish closer together and the fishermen, you know, should have more luck. And I think they did have good luck during the drawdown and uh, they may have had to fish slightly different areas than they were used to, but, you know, uh, usually fishermen are pretty good at adapting to the conditions and, and once they kind of pattern the fish and, and figure out where to go, they can, they can be pretty effective at catching them. And what you say is presuming all else being equal, but in the drawdown, did you lose any fish? Yes. One, one of the, the effects of the drawdown is it did uh, reduce the amount of cool water habitat in the lake. With the less volume of water, that late summer, fall effect of the oxygen depleting in deep water became more pronounced, and we did lose striped bass habitat and walleye habitat, and I think I mentioned earlier, we did have some fish kills associated with low oxygen and deep water during the drawdown. 
I wouldn't think it would be proportionate, though. If you lost 25 or 26 percent of the lake, did you lose 25 or 26 percent of the fish? Well, it's hard. It's hard to say. Um, you know, typically, I take striped bass for example. Normally, in in most years, by late summer, early fall, they tend to move downstream toward the dam because that's usually where the best water quality is in terms of cool water that has adequate oxygen levels. So I think most of the fish did move down toward the dam, and and the zone of water they were in eventually depleted so much that they essentially ran out of oxygen. And they could have, you know, moved into shallower water and had plenty of oxygen, but it would be really warm water. So they were they were kind of in a catch-22. They could stay in the cool water and run out of oxygen, or they could move to the warm water and have plenty of oxygen but be stressed because of the warm temperatures. So during those few years of the drawdown, the stripers especially, you know, became very skinny. They quit eating this late summer, and then we had a, a pretty severe fish kill, I think, in 2011. But fortunately, that was really the only major kill we had, and, uh, and they are certainly on their way back now. Do you think that Lake Cumberland has lost any customers? If people just take their boat out of the water and go to another lake? You know, maybe a little. I, I think that's not as big of an issue as, as some people would think. I mean, I know when the, when the lake was first drawn down, everybody thought there wasn't any water in the lake, you know, and it's still at 37,000 acres. There's, you know, a, a lot of water, uh, you know, for boating and, and fishing. And, and some people actually said they liked it a little bit lower elevation because it exposed more of the shoreline is easier to tie house boats and you know it's kind of a kind of a new almost a new lake because it looked differently you know we may have lost a few but i think if we did lose some because of low water they they'll be back uh, once the lake's full here tourism took a hit and i know some boating ramps launching ramps marinas also took a hit to the tune of what i'm not sure is that going to rebound i think it will you know in the economy kind of went south too so you know i think it was more than just the lake drawdown i mean it's been tough you know people aren't as uh flush with cash uh, in recent years as maybe they were you know eight or ten years ago but uh, I, I think it i think it will come back and and i think the core did a really good job of extending a lot of the ramps so that they were still functional with the reduced water level Good deal. That's off to the core. So 680 was the old number. That's a number you never want to see again. Right. But 723 is on its way back, if not there already. Now we're, we're starting to talk about now the new lake effect, and that's a term that you fisheries biologists use to find what that means. Okay, typically in a new lake, uh, you have kind of a boom cycle for fish production uh, what happens when you flood the land, all those nutrients that are tied up in the soils and the plant material on the land, then gets transferred into the uh, aquatic community. And so usually you have really good growth on the fishes, expansion of the populations of the fishes. So it's it's a really good time for fishermen because the fish are growing fast. There's lots of them, and it's it's kind of a boom cycle. So you're saying you've had vegetation, trees, shrubbery, uh, grasses, what have you, grow up along the shoreline that was exposed when the water level had dropped and been there for six years. You've had several years of growth of this, and now you're going to flood it. And what other pe- people may look at and say, oh, that's, that's weeds, is really nutrients for fish, right? turtles. Nut- nutrients and and cover it's it's amazing to me is how fast trees can grow under the right conditions we've got sycamore trees you know like pure stands of sycamore trees up in the the heads of the creeks and willow trees Uh, but sycamores i bet are 15 or 20 feet tall just in you know six seven years Hmm. and once the lake gets up over those and most it's over a lot of it now uh, you know that's going to be incredible habitat that we didn't have seven or eight years ago uh, it's going to have to be new habitat in the lake. I was a little boy, I think, at the time. I'll tell you a story about a lake drawdown. This was up in Carrollton, Kentucky, and there we have the local lake up there in the state park. And for whatever reason, I, I didn't really know the story. I can't remember if this was high school or middle school, but next like 70s, let's, let's say, that they they drained the lake. Mm-hmm. I guess they were repairing a dam. I don't know why, but I noticed that the lake was was really drawn down, 
And over the a year or two, some things started to grow up, you know, shrubbery and vegetation and this plant and that. And to me, remember, I was a stupid kid. I would look out there and say, well, surely they're going to cut that. That's unsightly. Surely they're going to mow that down. Look at all that that's grown up. Because I was sort of equating a fishing lake with a swimming pool, that it had to be crystal clear and beautiful. And there was nothing further from the truth. And right. they started to refill it, and they refilled it up over what had grown. And someone had mentioned to me, well, that's a great place for fish. Now you know where to fish. If you know where the trees are, now you know where to fish. Right. And I would say there's a lot of people on Cumberland that, that marked a lot of areas that, that said this is going to be good when the water gets back up over it. And so uh, I would say a lot of anglers did their homework during this past uh, six or seven years with marking a lot of areas that uh, that look good to them uh, with a full lake. When you mark an area, is that a GPS term? Yes, with the new technologies and GPS units, it's really great. You can just go up on a spot, push a button, and you've marked a waypoint. Then when the lake's full, you can go right back to that waypoint and fish that spot. So uh, fish finder units with GPS technology is, is really amazing for fishermen. we got to get to a break, but John Williams will stay with us through the rest of the hour. When we come back, we will talk about big fish, more like monster fish. Fishermen will be seeing as a result of the rise in water level at Lake Cumberland. It's a good show. Stay with us. I'm Charlie Baglin. You are listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Charlie Baglin in on Kentucky Afield Radio. If you have missed any of our shows or you'd like to hear again or share on Facebook, Easy to find. Go to myhuntingandfishing.com. You can also find us on YouTube. There's our channel out there, Kentucky Field Radio, as well as Kentucky Field TV. You can find the podcast on iTunes. So older shows or your favorite repeats, easy to find. Time now for our fishing report. This is Jeff Crosby with the Central Fisheries Fishing Report. Consider beaver. Elmer Davis, Giffs Creek, or Taylorsville Lake for catching a few largemouth, crankbaits, swim jigs, and also soft plastics such as creature baits are very productive, especially around vegetation or along shoreline cover. Additionally, bluegill and red ear sunfish is very good at our area lakes, especially Beaver Lake and Elmer Davis. Fishermen are catching these fish using red worms, wax worms, or crickets fished around the edge of aquatic vegetation. And finally, it's an excellent time of year to get out and fish our local streams such as Elk. Corn Creek, South Fork Licking, or Floyd's Fork. Good catches of smallmouth and rock bass can be taken in these streams during this time of year on small jerk baits, crank baits, or jigs. Remember to ask for permission when entering private property. So grab a pole and enjoy some great spring fishing. Hi, this is Kevin Fry with your Eastern Area Fisheries Port. Bluegill and red ear sunfish are getting a lot of attention from anglers now. Fish are staged in bedding areas and red worms and small jigs catching fish. Shallow water from one to six foot depth with mud bottom or bed areas. Fish trap, pan bowl, dewey, Paintsville and Yatesville lakes are producing good numbers of bluegill and red ear sunfish. Also note at dusk or end of day with a cool night has been producing some very good bluegill action. A few crappies still being caught by anglers fishing for bluegill. However, better reports for crappie are from deeper areas of 10 foot around brush piles or suspended fish and timber. Another fishery to consider right now would be stream smallmouth fishing. The streams are finally calm after all our spring flooding, and anglers are reporting increased success. Hi, this is Eric Cummins with your Southwest Kentucky Fishing Report. Barren River Lake is just above Sunder Pool, and bass are being caught with a variety of baits. Topwaters, crankbaits, spinnerbaits, chatterbaits, Carolina rigs, and jigs have all been successful options. Fish are anywhere from 2 to 12 feet. Black crappie are still up shallow, and white crappie have moved out a little bit onto the channels. Channel catfish are being taken with jugs and hook and line with worms and liver. Bluegill have been good in two to four foot of water with crickets, worms, and wax worms, especially in the back end of coves or cuts. Green River Lake is its summer pool and been steady. Likewise, bass are being taken on a variety of baits, some still shallow and some started to move out deep. As always, good luck and good fishing. Be sure you wear your life jacket.
Baglin here on Kentucky Field Radio, my home address for the rest of the hour. And our topic on this show is the comeback of Lake Cumberland. There is a new lake on top of the old lake. And just what that new water means mixed in with all that vegetation that has grown up along the banks over these several years means, especially if you like to fish. After the break. Swimming has taken me around the world. Olympic swimming gold medalist, Rachel Komazar. It's a thrill to swim for your country, but it's another to swim for your life. In a boating accident, that's what happens. It can happen to you. You could be hurt, dazed, unconscious. Being a good swimmer isn't good enough. When fun turns frantic, trust me, your life jacket is as good as gold. Kentucky Fish and Wildlife reminds you, your life jacket's got your back and the backing of the best swimmers. Everywhere You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Welcome back. My name is Charlie Baglin, your host. And if you have just joined us, we are talking to John Williams. John is in charge of all things fishing for Lake Cumberland. He is the head fisheries biologist for the southeastern region. Lake Cumberland, of course, Kentucky's largest lake by volume. And it was drawn down meaning the lake level reduced back in 2007 to make some repairs to the dam that contains the lake. Repairs are now in the books, and lake levels are restored. Lake Cumberland is back, and it is better than ever. And if you're listening to the show far away from Lake Cumberland, you think it may be years before you even get there, listen anyway. This is a fascinating topic on how fish populations work, how lakes function, and more. What kind of reaction are you seeing from the locals down there that the the lake basically now is back? I think it's more of an excitement uh, overall as as to what the new lake's going to be like. Pulse stocking. Lake Cumberland last year is compared to what it is as we speak is 25% larger. Did you do any pulse stocking to sort of bolster the fishing? Right, we did. We, and in fact in the past we we did some pulse stocking and by pulse I mean a put an extra number of fish in of the fish we do stock every uh, we do striped bass and walleye every third year we add extra fish and we primarily did this to see if those extra fish would show up later on as a better year class and so we pulse stocked stripers in 2006 2009 2012 and they did they did show up our best year classes are those pulse stockings and the looks like similar results with the walleye although the walleye population uh, seems harder hit uh, you know with the poor water quality we experienced over the last few years but anyway the pulse stockings do seem to work and we did put extra fish in last year of both both stripers and walleye I think a half a million stripers a half a million walleye which is about 150,000 more uh, of each than we normally stock just in anticipation of the lake being full this year and usually what happens when on those young fish they can take the warm water pretty well so really the you know having the cool water habitat's not critical until they're two or three years old so uh, so we stocked last year thinking that you know they'd still be young fish and, and be fine this year and then you know with the lake being completely full we think that there'll be better cool water habitat you know those those stockings will produce uh, two or three years down the road into some uh, very good year classes. Cedar Creek Lake, it's a relatively new lake. Have you seen any monster keepers come out of there? And I bring it up because if you have a essentially a new lake with all the extra vegetation at Cumberland, is that when you're going to see the really monster fish, maybe even a state record, come into play? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of a lot of factors that that go into producing a record fish, but uh, speaking of Cedar Creek Lake, it you know obviously we've expect we've uh, experienced the new lake effect there, and it is a phenomenal largemouth bass fishery. Of course, it's you know a rel- relatively shallow lake. It's relatively fertile. There's a lot of standing timber in that lake, a lot of vegetation in that lake. But the bass there, if you want to go catch a trophy largemouth, that's the place to go. Uh, the, the fish look look incredible there. Dale Hollow Lake where the world record smallmouth bass uh, was caught. Now, that was caught shortly after that lake was impounded, was it not? And you had the new lake effect there. Right, and, and uh, I think it was caught in 55. I'm not sure when when Del Hollow was impounded, but it was probably in the late 40s or so. So that, you know, that makes sense with the new lake effect there. Uh, 
you know, Wood Creek Lake produced the state record largemouth, and that was probably a New Lake effect fish. So, uh, you know, anytime you build a lake, flood vegetation, release all those nutrients into the food chain, the aquatic food chain, uh, you know, like I say, fish grow great, and the potential to get very large is, is good in those type of situations. It will have a similar effect, probably not quite the same as it would be, you know, filling up Lake Cumberland for the first time, but we will get a, a similar effect with the lake filling up now. So this lake was filled up, it went from 680 back t- to normal pool in stages? Right. This In 2013, they raised it up to se- roughly uh, elevation 700, 700 to 705. And I think that was more to test the dam, see if it was, uh, you know, it was going to hold. And then uh, then they decided that everything was good and they were going to ha- go ahead and raise it up to full elevation this spring. And, of course, I'm, I'm sure, you know, everyone's heard about the darter that kind of delayed the raising of the lake, you know, for a few months. But uh, now that's behind us. They, you know, worked out a compromise on uh, protecting the dusky-tailed arter, and uh, so I, I think that's a actually was a good thing. It showed agencies working together to, you know, resolve the issues that needed to be resolved before the lake could come to full pool. The dusky-tailed darter. It sounds like an AC shiner. <laughs> well, a lot of the striper fishermen said it's the preferred bait for striped bass. So. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a small darter. It's it's a uh, probably three inches long or so. And you know most darters. There's actually a lot of darter species in Kentucky. I think there's about fifty, uh, fifty-five or sixty species of darters known from Kentucky. And a lot of people don't really even notice them. They're uh, typically inhabit uh, the streams and uh, small rivers in the state, and they're you know typically only two or three inches long and. Some of them are really pretty, uh, but you know darters have a certain type of habitat that they prefer. And of course, uh, you know if they were going to fill the lake up, then that was going to flood some of the habitat that the, that the darters prefer. They don't like deep water; they like relatively shallow water. So that that was kind of the issue. But one of the things I'd always told people that complained about, you know, why are we letting a little minnow uh, dictate raising of the water level? But the dusky tail darters an endangered species, and I. One of the things I always say is, well, if we'd have been better stewards of the environment and protected this fish, then it wouldn't wouldn't be endangered, and we wouldn't have to be, you know, jumping through these extra hoops to make sure it's protected. So it's kind of a lesson for all of us: as we take care of the environment, then we can uh, prevent endangered species and, and recover endangered species, and we won't have to work through these extra hoops to uh, uh, look out for them. That's one thing about endangered species: you might say, ah, oh, it's just a little teensy little minnow. But you never know, and just because it's the 21st century doesn't mean we know everything about everything yet. It could be 50 years from now, oh, it's a good thing we saved that because it has the ingredient that will help this type of cancer. You just never know right. how, never things, know. how things tie together, and we're still learning all those. You know, endangered species are, are a sign that something's going wrong in the environment. Uh, you know they're the more they're the more sensitive species, but they're kind of like the canary in the mine. You know when the canary dies, you know it's <laughs> you know the conditions are bad. So when we start losing species, we know we're harming the environment. That said, the new lake effect is still going on. Now the, the new lake effect you mentioned we're going to have sort of a double whammy new lake effect, but this isn't just a, a one and done type of season for the new lake effect. How many years? Will anglers be reaping benefits? I would say at least five or six years, maybe a decade. You know, the habitat that's grown up right now should last for many, many years. So uh, we've gone from a lake that had very little, especially woody habitat. You know, most of the shorelines, because of the constant raising and lowering of the lake, you know, that tends to erode the shorelines and and you lose a lot of the, the cover that you did have. And now that's replaced now with these young sycamore trees and willow trees. And so those should remain in the lake for a number of years. I want to go back to this press release that was published by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. And it has you quoted in here, John. It says, this will improve the water quality for two species, William said. The regular releases will also benefit trout in the tailwater. It should get the tailwater back to where it was before drawdown in a few years. How do you measure? How do you 
quantify where a tailwater was. How do you know that it's coming back? Tailwater for us was essentially the whole Kentucky portion of the Cumberland River below Wolf Creek Dam because in normal years before we start having the drawdown, you know, they would do releases every day uh, for hydropower generation, and that flows would extend the cool water that they're you know, essentially pulling out of the bottom of the lake or, you know, the mid, mid-depth and bottom of the lake would, you know, 50, 55-degree water would last through the entire tailwater uh, into the Tennessee portion. So we had essentially cold water habitat for the entire 75 miles of the Cumberland River below Wolf Creek Dam. Now, when they started working on the dam and lowered the lake level to 680, uh, the water they were pulling through was warmer uh, because the less, you know, the less uh, uh, less volume of water in the lake, they pulled it through. It was warmer. Plus, uh, if you remember, the first two years of the, I think, or at least the first year, it was a very dry summer, and there was a danger of them going below 680 uh, on the lake, and so they stopped releasing as much water into the tailwater. So we had very little releases, and that water was heating up as it was going down the tailwater. So we lost a lot of the cold water habitat in the tailwater and uh, we did see a dramatic shift in the species composition of the tailwater we're used to it was 95 percent trout either brown or rainbows we started seeing a lot of lot more species in the tailwater like catfish and bluegill uh, carp more warm water species and it really uh, the water color changed too it was more of a murky lake looking Effect instead of that crystal clear cold water that we, we were used to seeing. So it, it did change dramatically, but I'm, now that the lake level's back up and they're going to return to normal generation schedules, we'll see that cold water return and the clarity of the water return. And we've already seen a benefit this spring of really nice trout being caught in the tailwater. One other thing I might mention, this was a very cold winter, which will help us too. It's, we're starting from a colder base, so the tailwater should have plenty of volume of cold water coming to it. we got a shad die off because of the cold weather, and the tr- trout are fattening up on the shad in the tailwater, so it's been a great spring so far for the tailwater. A few minutes remain, and we will wrap up this great news about the rebirth of Kentucky's treasured lake for boating, fishing, skiing, vacationing. Lake Cumberland is the topic. I'm Charlie Baglin. You are listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Charlie Baglin back in our final segment with John Williams, Southeastern District Fisheries Biologist. John, one thing we have mentioned here in passing is Wolf Creek, the name Wolf Creek. Wolf Creek Dam, there is also Wolf Creek Hatchery. And thanks to that facility, Kentucky has trout. And I'm wondering, with the drawdown of Lake Cumberland over the years, if there has also been a drawdown in the number of rainbow trout that Wolf Creek Hatchery has been able to raise for stocking around the state. I'm not sure. I know we have we have expanded the fins program quite a bit in recent years. I would say we would certainly be able to extend that even more now that the hatchery will be back to normal operation so they can raise more trout. I think one of the things I like about trout is they're easily caught. So if you're wanting to take your family out for fishing and, you know, especially kids, they have a pretty short attention span and, and want pretty fast action, and trout provide that. And they're great for these fins lakes because we can stock them in the fall once the water cools down, and they provide a fishery from the fall through, you know, probably May of the next year before the water starts getting too warm for them to survive. And by that time, most of them are caught out, and the ones that uh, haven't been caught out are are good fish food for uh, some of the larger bass and fins lakes. So trout like it cold. They're active in cold water, whereas a bass slows way down. Right, right. So in the middle of winter when it's... 45 degrees out, the water temperature is 40, the trout are doing fine, and the and the bass are pretty lethargic. What's important to you that you would want to bring up? Uh, I guess the main thing I would like to, to mention is this. I think times are going to be good in Lake Cumberland, especially in the next few years. Uh, you know, our, With our cool water habitat back, the lake volume back, it's going to be good for the tailwater, good for the lake. All that habitat is going to be great for the bass and crappie and bluegill. And then the the extra volume of water and cool water habitat is going to be great for the stripers and the walleye. So 
I think we'll really see a, a big improvement across the board in the lake for fishing in the next several years. Tell me about John Williams. You're a district fisheries biologist, and there are seven folks, or six like you, uh, you make the seventh, in this state. What is it that a district biologist does? And I'm going to start this by t- talking a story about Kentucky Field TV that I know a little bit about. We had a fellow who said, oh, you are a cameraman for Kentucky Field, he once told a fellow that worked here. He said, that must be a great job. You just go out and turn the camera on, and and uh, 30 minutes later you turn it off, and you got a show. It's done. <laughs> And no, it's not quite that easy. And so, if people look at a district fisheries biologist, I can just I can hear right now what they're saying. This guy goes fishing for a living. That's the kind of job I want. <laughs> yeah. But it, there's more to it than that, isn't there? Right, right. When people see us out, they always say, "How do you get a job like that?" You know, that must be just ride around the boat and, and uh, catch fish and study fish. And and to be honest, it is a nice job. I'm I'm feel fortunate to have it, but. Uh, it is a little bit more complicated than that. We we do a lot of fish sampling. We try to keep tabs on the major sport fisheries in our area, and our major lakes are Lake Cumberland, Laurel Lake, Del Hall. And so we do a lot of fish sampling in the spring and the fall to try to evaluate the fish populations and to see if we need to change any regulations to improve those populations. So a lot of our work is, is fish sampling. And then we also do, uh, I'm on the phone quite a bit talking to anglers, you know, giving advice, talking about the different fish populations where I think, you know, they would have the best luck going if they're fishing for a particular species. Because uh, one thing in our line of work, we, we do have, uh, with the sampling gear we use, we, we generally do have a pretty good idea of what populations are doing well in, in the different lakes. So I, I feel, you know, pretty uh, confident on giving advice on where to go to, to uh, catch a particular species of fish. And then we do we do other work. We we, uh, we have a pond program where people have a farm pond that their fishing's poor in or they have a vegetation problem, offer advice on improving the populations in the pond. Uh, most people get their first fishing experience in ponds. Uh, I got my first fishing experience in ponds, so uh, we try to make that experience as good as possible so that they will become fishermen for life plus you need a little you need a little office management expertise too don't you right uh you know obviously we have to do the administrative type duties and and uh in our district we each have uh have an assistant biologist here and two uh, fish and wildlife technicians so we have kind of a close-knit group that goes out and, and uh and does the fish sampling and the other duties that we do and uh and then like as you say there's six other districts with uh similar personnel and uh, uh, our district essentially follows mostly the Cumberland River drainage, uh, Upper Cumberland. And uh, uh, I think that's the way they divided up most of the districts early is tried to put them, uh, each district in a major water drainage. Let's go at it from this perspective. If you didn't exist, or you or anybody like you, if someone were saying, oh, that lake, Lake Cumberland's a natural lake, that's a natural thing, you know, nature takes care of itself, and if you weren't there to do your work, what kind of condition would fishing in this state be? Well, I'd like to think we have an effect, a positive effect, on the on the fish population. Essentially, our job is to protect those fish populations so that future generations can enjoy the same opportunities that the current generations have. And I think, you know, there's been a shift over the years. Used to, most fishermen were harvest-oriented and, and, you know, they pretty much try to keep everything they, they caught. And there's been a shift. There's a lot more catch-and-release fishing, which is good for sustaining the fish populations. And uh, one of the other things I think that's helped is the digital cameras. You know, most, most people at least have a, a camera on their phone or take a small digital cameras, and so they don't have to take the fish home to, to brag about it, you know, have it mounted on the wall. They can take a picture of it and send it around on Facebook or Twitter or, or whatever and show all their buddies what uh, what a nice fish they caught. Well, you do good work, John Williams, and you've been at it for a number of years. I'm glad we've got you on the job there. Let me ask you this question. Do you text and drive? No, I do not. Uh, with the texting, and that's one thing I tell my daughter all the time: make sure you don't, you're not texting and driving, because uh, you know, obviously, it's a recipe for disaster. All right, John. Well, thanks a million. We'll be listening for your voice on the fishing reports occasionally. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Charlie. 
John Williams, Southeastern District Fisheries Biologist with the Kentucky Division of Fisheries. It has been a good show. While we're talking about lakes and water and summer, if you're fishing, wakeboarding, tubing, just out to soak up the sun, wear your life jacket. Those big old pillowy orange things are ugly, I guarantee you. But with today's modern life jacket design, safety never looks so good. Sometimes you don't even know you've got it on. Your life jacket's got your back. We are out of time. Join us in a week and we will go inside outdoors again. Right here on Kentucky Afield Radio. Thank you.